Teresa. Children ages three through second grade, you're dismissed to children's church. We're in Genesis chapter 27, verses 30 to 45. Just one verse short of completing chapter 27. We'll do that next week. But we're going to be talking about how sin separates today, <clears throat> and specifically deception. <clears throat> but I want to start with this illustration. The cashier had already rung up Carrie Wooster's items when she realized she didn't have her wallet. She dashed to her car and returned empty-handed to to face the line of fidgeting customers she had kept waiting. A cell phone pressed to her ear. Jordan, did you take my wallet out of my purse? She asked in parental exasperation as she made her way back to the checkout counter. I'm holding up the line. You need to put things back where you find them. Wooster, who has no children, was not actually talking to a Jordan or indeed to anyone at all. But her monologue served its purpose, earning her sim sympathetic looks from the frustrated crowd um, at her local Walmart. Call Wooster a cell phony. She's part of a growing number of people who are using their cell phones to carry on fake conversations to deceive or manipulate those around them. Some cell phonies use their cell phones to avoid contact with the annoying coworkers or supervisors. Some pretend to be fi finishing a call when they arrive late for a meeting. The fake phone call has a technique all its own. Inexperienced cell phonies risk exposure with their limited repertoire of uh -huh. sophisticated simulators achieve authentic authenticity, I should say, by reenacting their side of an actual dialogue, or they call voice-activated phone trees so it sounds as if someone is talking on the other end. A little bit of deception there, isn't it? As they're try, trying to trick people, trying to stay out of trouble. But, you know... Um, when we think about fraud or deception, uh, probably we know of people that have been experienced that, or maybe we've, ex we've experienced it ourselves. Um, several Wednesday evenings ago, and well, it's probably been a couple of months ago, <clears throat> on a Wednesday evening, I'm leading the worship-based prayer when my cell phone uh, vibrates in my pocket. I'm like, it doesn't normally do anything at this time, and I pull it out, and it's a text message from my credit card company saying, did you make this purchase? for something over $2,000. <laughs> no, I'm in the middle of a worship uh, service. No, I didn't do that. So text no if it wasn't you, and we'll close your account. So I did, and then after service, Judy and I went home, and we were checking email uh, on the phone. She says, we got an email about another purchase for like $2,500. <laughs> and uh, that one didn't come through the fraud alert uh, text message. And so we had to call our credit card company. We had to shut the credit card down uh, a couple of days before our vacation. This is the card that we normally use when we go on vacation. So <clears throat> anyhow, it was fraud, right? Someone was trying to say that they were me buying furniture, I think, from different places online. And then just a couple of days before Prime Day, just here in July, I got a text message saying, hey, this is Amazon letting you know that there's been suspicious uh, activity on your Amazon account, and so it's been uh, suspended. And it wasn't from them because it didn't, it didn't say Amazon. The, the, you know, the email or whatever that it came from or the text message was not Amazon, but they wanted me to click a link, right, to go and, and check out my account to make sure that everything was safe and that this, everything was good. Well, I, did, I just deleted it. And then... While Judy's parents were up here visiting with us just this past week, she starts reading a message out loud. This is Amazon letting you know there's been some suspicious, you know, unusual activity on your account, and you need to follow this link in order to take care of it. And I said, no, oh, just delete it. <laughs> That's spam. It's junk, right? And so how many of us have experienced fraud? Just think about that for a minute. Maybe your credit card uh, got stolen somehow, the number. Maybe you've experienced deception with Maybe you got the same text message or email that I did or Judy's parents got about Amazon, leading right up to the Amazon Prime Day. How did it make you feel? Good? Yeah, it makes you feel angry, doesn't it? It, it, it was frustrating for us because we were like, now, now we've got to use another credit card that we don't normally use that often while we're on this trip and everything. And, and so it was just, and now I had to wait for the new card to come, and I had to activate that, and everything had to get switched over because we have some things that are auto-paid, and, you know, all that stuff is going on. 
And it's like, oh, this is so frustrating. So we're going to see some of that today. In this passage of scripture, Esau returns from his hunting trip. Pastor Mark shared that with us last, last, last week, what Isaac had asked them to go do. And he prepares the meal his father had asked him to prepare, only to find out that his father had already eaten and given his blessing to a deceiver, to an imposter. Both Isaac and Esau experienced heartache when the deception was revealed. And this uh, sin of deception caused heartache for everyone involved and was going to separate this whole family. And this is true for us also. And so we're going to learn today our big idea that our deceptions cause heartache. And so let's just uh, commit this to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we just come to you this morning recognizing that, Lord, some of us are here this morning with heartache because of deception. And I pray that your Holy Spirit would just speak to us. As we look into your word, Lord God, would you encourage those that are experiencing that heartache today? And Lord, too, I pray that you would help us to know and help us to be the kind of people that you would bless. And so, Lord, I, I lift that up to you as well as we look at that aspect in this passage today. I pray, Lord God, that you would speak through your servant who is a cracked and chipped vessel. Lord, I'm grateful that you use me in spite of my weaknesses. And so would you speak today? Would only your truth be spoken? And we just ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to look at two points today, revealed and retreat. The first point is verses 30 to 40, and then 41 to 45 is the second point today. But we're just going to look at single verses at a time as we go through this first point. Um, Let's look at Genesis chapter 27, verse 30. This is what God's Word says. After Isaac finished blessing him and Jacob had scarcely left his father's presence, his brother Esau came in from hunting. And so Jacob is almost caught in his deception. We're not told how long it took Esau to successfully catch some wild game. We're also not told how long it took Rebekah to prepare the kind of tasty food that Isaac liked uh, and, given, given, and then give it to Jacob for him to go in and, uh, and you know, take, uh, be deceptive. We're not told, it, um, but we are told, I should say, that Jacob was almost caught in his deception. Jacob had scarcely left his father's presence when Esau arrived back from the hunt. Now, how, could, how would Jacob explain the goat skins covering his hands and neck to his brother? Maybe his brother wouldn't have cared about that. He's like, well, maybe he's just trying to start a new fashion you know, style or something. I don't know what you're doing, bro, but that's weird. But he's also wearing some of Esau's good clothes. So how is he going to explain that one to his brother? Hey, just was uh, trying this out just because I thought it would look good on you, you know? Um, so I'm trying this, this, new, this new design out. But, so it was a close call. But somehow Jacob eluded Esau's attention when he returned. Now, how many of us can relate to Jacob's stress at this point? He had already questioned his mother about tricking his father. He's like, I don't think this is going to be good. He's going to know that I'm not Esau, right? I'm smooth skin. My brother has got hair all over his body. You know, um, even though they were twins, there must have been some difference in their voice. And we're going to hear about that in just a minute. Um, <clears throat> and he's, so Jacob's like questioning his mother. He's like, I, if I go in there and he finds out this deception, he's not going to bless me. He's going to curse me. I don't want to be cursed. And so when we do something wrong or deceptive, we're hyper aware of our surroundings and who may be watching. And I don't know about you, but in our culture today, you have to be so careful because with cameras on cell phones, it's inevitable that someone is watching. Someone has videotaped what you just did or taken pictures of something you just did. There's highway cameras, right? There's cameras uh, outside of buildings and different things like that. And say we're constantly being videoed, constantly being uh, having our picture taken. There's a face recognition all over the place now too, right? Uh, in air- airports and in different places like that. And so we're constantly uh, having to be aware of what's going on. 
We don't want to get caught and exposed for doing something wrong or being deceptive. And while we're uh, acting deceptively, we experience a great deal of stress. I think that's what Jacob's going through here. And perhaps every one of us can recall a time when we almost got caught, when we experienced a close call. And so Jacob almost got caught, but fortunately Esau was focusing on completing the task that his father had given to him. We see that in verse 31. This is what God's word says. He too prepared some tasty food and brought it to his father. Then he said to him, uh, my father, sit up and eat some of my game so that you may give me your blessing. And so we see this completed task. Esau brought the wild game back and immediately began to prepare it. That's probably why he didn't see Jacob and what Jacob was doing. He was doing just what his father had asked him to do, and he was preparing it just the way his father liked. And then he took it to his father and had him sit up so he could eat some of his game and then bless Esau. But Isaac was confused at this point because he had just eaten and had blessed whom he thought was Esau. So we see here that he's confused in verse 32. His father Isaac asked him, Who are you? I am your son, he answered, your firstborn, Esau. And so Esau brings this second meal. Isaac asks him who he is. And if you remember, Isaac had asked Jacob to come near to him so he could touch him. He was confused with the first meal because Jacob felt hairy like Esau. Isaac could tell the difference between their voices, but the body hair made Esau distinct. And so Isaac knew that the voice sounded like Jacob's, but he could not deny the hairy hands that he was feeling. Now on Thursday evening, uh, Mark Sobel and I were together, and we were talking through this passage And I asked him, because he's a twin, I said, Mark, can your parents tell the difference in your voices? And he said, my dad can on the phone, but I don't think my mom can. And so that's fascinating, right? I don't know, dads have some intuition when it comes to twin boys, I guess. They can tell the difference in the voice. That's what Isaac was like, something's wrong here. This sounds like Jacob to me, but boy, it feels like Esau. Esau responds to his father's inquiry by telling him, I am your son. Don't you recognize me? I'm doing what you just told me to do. Here's the meal. I'm your firstborn, Esau. And then in verses 33 and 34, we see the heartache of both Isaac and then Esau. Look at those two verses with me, if you would. This is what God's word says. Isaac trembled violently and said, Who was it then that hunted game and brought it to me? I ate it just before you came, and I blessed him, and indeed he will be blessed. When Esau heard his father's words, he burst out with a loud and bitter cry and said to his father, Bless me, me too, my father. You see, you see, do you see the heartache in both of them? Isaac trembled a great trembling exceedingly. That's the literal translation from the original language, from the Hebrew. Isaac trembled a great trembling exceedingly. He wanted to know who had hunted game and brought it to him if it was not Esau. Perhaps Isaac was trembling violently out of anger that he had been deceived and his plan had been fa- and his plan failed. Yeah, I, yeah, I get, I would get angry too. But maybe Isaac was trembling violently out of fear, knowing that he had tried to overrule God's plan. Maybe there was fear and anger combined there. What had been planned in secret was now being revealed, and you see, our deceptions cause heartache. It caused heartache for. Isaac. You see, Isaac knew, he knew that Jacob was going to be the covenant carrier. He knew the prophecy, but he was trying to overrule God's plan. And so it just brought heartache to him. Isaac's plan was unraveling, and he knew it. Several things were mentioned last week, um, and Baldwin, uh, in their commentary, Uh, outlines them really, really well. So Isaac only invited Esau to the blessing ceremony and not Jacob. He was being deceptive. Isaac also tried to keep the legal transaction a secret instead of including the required witnesses. Do you understand what he was doing here? The blessing meant that he was was, uh, like his last will and testament. He was handing everything over, all of his possessions, the authority as head of the family. That's what he was doing in this blessing. And they needed to have witnesses there in order to make this legal transaction correct. Isaac discounted the prophecy given to Rebekah that Jacob would be the chosen covenant carrier. And then finally, Isaac also marginalized the fact that Esau sold his birthright for a bowl of red stew. Esau did not value his birthright. 
he was not the kind of man and living the kind of life that God would bless. Gango and Bramer say this, at last the old man realized that the heavenly hunter had caught up with him to rebuke his coddling favoritism of the rebellious older son in spite of God's promise to Rebekah, Esau's denial of the birthright, and the agony of the Hittite wives that Esau had married. Isaac had tried to force his will on the matter, but God had already established and communicated his plan. Isaac explained to Esau that he had eaten the food right before he had come in and had blessed the imposter. And because the blessing was a legal transaction, it would not be revoked. And basically because then Isaac would have to admit that he wasn't doing it correctly. He wasn't following protocol. The blessing would stand because it had been done in the presence of the Lord. Pastor Mark shared that last week. That's Genesis 27, 7. That's what Isaac is saying to Esau. You go catch some game. You come back. I'm going to bless you in the presence of the Lord. This is a transaction before God. This was a covenant transaction. So he wasn't going to break it. The Lord did not reveal Jacob's deception to Isaac because it was his plan for Jacob to receive the blessing. You know, God could have done that, right? He could have just whispered in Isaac's ear, hey, by the way, you are right. This isn't Esau. You heard correctly. This is the voice of Jacob. He doesn't do that, though, because it was his plan for Jacob to receive that blessing. Next, we see Esau's reaction to the fact that the blessing would stand. We see Esau's heartache as he burst out with a loud and bitter cry. It can be literally translated as he cried a great and exceedingly bitter cry. He's heartbroken. But what had Esau so upset? Hebrews chapter 12, Teresa read one of these verses to you today, but I want to start back with verse 16. See that no one is sexually immoral or is godless like Esau, who for a, a single meal sold his inheritance rights to the, as the oldest son. Afterward, as you know, when he wanted to inherit this blessing, he was rejected. He could bring about no change of mind, though he sought the blessing with tears. This is a commentary on this particular passage in Genesis. Wearsby says this, Esau's tears were not tears of repentance for being an ungodly man. They were tears of regret because he had lost the covenant blessing. Esau wanted the blessing, but he did not want to be the kind of man whom God could bless. We may forget our decisions, but our decisions don't forget us. You see, Esau wanted to be the head of the family. He wanted to inherit all the resources uh, from his father. He wanted that wealth, but he did not want to live the kind of life that God would bless. God knew his heart. You see, our deceptions cause heartache. That's what Esau is experiencing here. And this is true of us also, right? I read a post this week that said, we cry out to God to heal our land, but we don't want to humble ourselves, pray, seek God's face, and turn from our wicked ways. We want the same thing, right? We want the blessing of God, right? God, would you heal our land? Would you just take care of all this chaos that's going on, all this uh, high inflation, all whatever, all the stuff that we don't agree with and we're upset about? God, would you heal our land? But we, guess what? We don't want to humble ourselves. We don't want to pray. We don't want to seek God's face. We don't want to turn from our wicked ways, but we still want him to bless us. So we don't want to live the kind of life that God would bless we say we want to grow in our faith, but uh, we aren't willing to sacrifice other things in order to spend time studying God's word and praying. I, I, here it is again. God, would you just bless me? Help me to grow my faith. But I don't want to pray. I don't want to spend time studying your word. We say we want to see revival and the revitalization of the church, but we're unwilling to fall on our faces before the Lord in personal revival. We're unwilling to join in prayer efforts that can bring about revival and instead, we justify the reasons why we can't join in those prayer efforts, why we can't invite others to church or other special services. We make excuses. We say, we just can't do that. No, it's just inconvenient for me. Really? If we really want God to heal our land, to help us grow in our faith, and to revive uh, individuals and revitalize churches, then we have to be willing to do what he asks us to do in order to see that accomplished. We have to stop playing 
the quote-unquote religious game and genuinely pursue a transformed life. And I want to invite everyone to sacrifice everything else to join us for two important times of prayer every week. Wednesday evenings at 7 p.m., we do worship-based prayer. It's important. If you can be here, you need to be here. And Saturday mornings at 8 a.m., we're praying that God will revitalize the church, that he would draw people to this place. This is what he's calling us to. Prayer is the greater work, and we need to sacrifice everything to be at these two opportunities for prayer. We need to tell God with our actions, we're serious about this. We want to see revival. We want to see the revitalization of the church. We want to see people saved. We want to see people baptized. But we have to make sacrifices. We need to show God that we're serious about this. This isn't a game. This is our whole purpose. Why he's placed us on earth. We see it in the Great Commission. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have taught you, and I'll be with you to the very end of the age. We can't keep playing church. Francis Chan has said in his book, Letters to the Church, he said, what would the church look like if we just bulldozed everything that the church is currently doing and started over with only those who are genuine believers, followers of Christ, that are willing to sacrifice father and mother, brothers and sisters, spouse, children, their own lives, all of their possessions in order to be a disciple of Christ. Christ says, if you're not willing to do that, you're not worthy to be my disciple. It's, it's a real problem in the American church today. That, man, we will go and sacrifice to do all these other things, but we won't sacrifice for the Lord. That has to change. It has to change. I want to challenge you to sign up to attend the worship and prayer night for the God Loves You tour. And with... Uh, with Franklin Graham on August 16th. And I also want to challenge you to sign up for the God Loves You Tour on September 25th and invite someone to join you. This is important. We can't keep doing what we've always been doing. We have to make change. We have to be the kind of people that God will bless. And so Esau was upset because he, re he regretted losing the covenant blessing and he pleaded with his father to bless him too. Isaac was not able to do that because the blessing had been accomplished. We see that in verses 35 to 38. Look at those verses with me if you would. Now I've got to get these out. But he said, your brother came deceitfully and took your blessing. Esau said, isn't he rightly named Jacob? He has deceived me these two times. He took my birthright, and now he's taken my blessing. Then he asked, haven't you reserved any blessing for me? Isaac answered Esau, I have made him lord over you and have made all his relatives his servants, and I have sustained him with grain and new wine, so, that, so what can I possibly do for you, my son? Esau said to his father, do you have only one blessing, my father? Please bless me too, my father. Then Esau wept aloud. Isaac acknowledged that Jacob deceived, or received the blessing through deception. But again, the blessing would stand because it was God's plan. And that just leads us to our first principle today, that God's plans will ultimately succeed. God is all-knowing. He's all-powerful. He's sovereign. He's eternal. He's unchanging. He knows what's best for us individually and corporately. And when we try to forge ahead with our plans instead of his, he will use any means necessary to get us back on track. Wolke in his commentary says, God may use human sin to affect his purposes. And some of you today might be going, what? What are you talking about? God may use human sin? Yeah. Yeah. He may use human sin in order to bring about his plan and purpose. You see, God's ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. They're higher than ours. And in our humanness, we look at that and go, that's wrong. Why is God blessing sin? That doesn't make any sense to me. But we have to step back from this narrow narrative 
to the larger narrative of Scripture, of all of Scripture, and what's God trying to accomplish? The sending of his son, Jesus. And it's to come through a particular line that God has already established and communicated. And so he's like, well, here we are. I don't really approve or agree with Jacob dressed up like Esau, but I'm going to use it because Jacob is the covenant carrier. And so he's looking from this, what we would call a meta-narrative, the large narrative, and, and bringing about his plan and purpose because his plans will ultimately succeed. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 6 to 8 tell us this. We do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature, but not the wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. No, we speak of God's secret wisdom, a wisdom that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. None of the rulers of this age understood it, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Again, this is talking about Christ's crucifixion and how God used the sin of man, human sin, in order to bring about Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, right? They accused him of things he did not do because Jesus is perfectly without sin. But they lied about him in order to have him crucified. But that was for God's plan and purpose. How does this apply to us today? Are you fighting against God's plan right now? Maybe it's something individually, maybe it's something corporately. As a church that you're fighting against, it may involve a personal preference that God may be asking you to give up. It may be an attitude of the heart that God wants to transform in you. Are you willing to let go and let God accomplish his plan and purpose in the situation? And so the first next step today is to stop fighting against God's plan and join him in what he wants to accomplish individually and or corporately. He's going to (laughs) win by any means possible because he's sovereign. He's all-powerful. Jacob had received the blessing through deception, which is why Esau says that he was living up to his name. We see Esau's lament here. He says, Jacob is named correctly. Jacob's name literally means he grasps the heel. Now, that was because of how he was birthed, right? He was holding on to Esau's heel when he came out. So they named him Jacob. But figuratively, his name means, Jacob means he deceives. So perhaps that name came about as a result of what Jacob was doing here, right? How he was deceptive all along the way, and he isn't going to stop that for a long time. We'll see that in the coming weeks. So Jacob's name could be like, Used like a verb, right? You Jacob me once, but never again. Right? <laughs> now, just to bring it to modern day, we didn't watch the awards ceremony, but it, it was all over the internet afterwards when Will Smith went up to Chris Rock and slapped him on the face, right? During this awards ceremony. So um, I jokingly say that now you can use Will Smith's name as a verb. So, like, if somebody slaps you, you can say, I got Will Smith, right? I got Will Smith. Yeah, so, again, now Will Smith's going to have to live into that name, right? <laughs> because of what he did. I think the same is true with Jacob's name here. It's like he just continued to deceive, and while people would say, well, we can use his name that way. It means that you deceive, or he deceives. Esau states that Jacob deceived him two times, once to get his birthright and once Um, to get his blessing. Jacob definitely manipulated Esau to get his birthright by withholding food until Esau swore to give it to him. The text doesn't seem to indicate that Jacob deceived Esau in order to get it. We said that Jacob didn't value his birthright enough to sacrifice food to get to keep it. It appears that Esau knew full well what he was doing when he sold his birthright. In another translation, um, It doesn't talk about him uh, being deceived two times, but basically being manipulated twice, taken advantage of twice. I think that that, um, translation might be a little bit better here. Esau asks a couple of questions then of his father. He says, haven't you reserved any blessing for me? 
Esau was basically asking if Isaac had given all the blessing to Jacob. Have you given everything to him? And Isaac's response reveals that he had given all the blessing to Jacob. There was none left. Isaac gave Jacob all authority over the head as head of the family. He would be the Lord over everyone else, and everyone else would serve him. Isaac also gave all the blessing of resources to Jacob. Both the field and the vine would, re, would sustain him. He would have the dew of heaven and the richness of the earth. Uh, Mark shared that last week. Isaac asks Esau what he could possibly do for him when he's already given everything to Jacob. Esau wanted to clarify one more thing, so he asks another question. Do you have only one blessing, my father? He pleaded again with Isaac to bless him too, and then he wept aloud. What Isaac says next in answering Esau's second question is not a blessing, but rather an anti-blessing. We see that in verses 39 and 40. His father Isaac answered him, Your dwelling will be away from the earth's richness, away from the dew of heaven above. You will live by the sword and you will serve your brother. But when you grow restless, you will throw his yoke from off your neck. And so we see here that this place of dwelling will be harsh. Jacob will experience, he- will, Jacob, I'm sorry, will experience heaven's dew and the earth's ri- richness. Esau's dwelling will be away from the earth's richness and the dew of heaven. It's the exact opposite. It's an anti-blessing. Esau's territory was on the border of the desert, which, had, which made farming impossible. And then Kyle and Dillich say, this is generally the condition of the mountainous country of Edom. And remember, Edom is another name for Esau, which although not without its fertile slopes and valleys, especially in the eastern portion, is thoroughly waste and barren in the western, so that Seetzen, who's another author, says it consists of the most desolate and barren mountains probably in the world. That was where Esau was ending up. Away from the richness of the earth and the dew of heaven. His daily living would be tumultuous. The Edomites remained at odds with the Israelites throughout history. Scholars were divided over when Esau's descendants threw Jacob's yoke off their necks. Some say it happened during the reign of Jehoram in 2 Kings chapter 8, verses 20 to 22. Others say it was during the reign of Ahaz, a couple of kings later in 2 Kings chapter 16, verse 6. Still others believe it was later through Antipater and Herod when they created an Edomian dynasty over Judea that lasted until the Jew, Jewish state was completely dissolved. And then one scholar believes that it's when the Antichrist rises to power and sets up his image in the temple in Jerusalem. Whenever it happened or will happen, we can trust that it did or will that he's going to throw off that yoke. And none of this sits well with Esau, so he plans to kill Jacob. And so Jacob has to retreat. That's our second point today. Look at verses 41 to 45. Esau held a grudge against Jacob because of the blessing his father had given him. He said to himself, The days of mourning for my father are near, then I will kill my brother Jacob. When Rebekah was told what her older son had said, She sent for her younger son, Jacob, and said to him, Your brother Esau is consoling himself with the thought of killing you. Now then, my son, do what I say. Flee at once to my brother Laban and Haran. Stay with him for a while until your brother's fury subsides. When your brother is no longer angry with you and forgets what you did to him, I'll send word for you to come back from there. Why should I lose both of you in one day? So we see Esau's grudge here. It's not hard to believe that Esau held a grudge against Jacob. When we're expecting something to happen a particular way and then it doesn't happen that way, it's easy to hold a grudge, right? He was thinking, my father is going to bless me. I'm going to get everything. I'm going to be the head of the family. I'm going to have all the possessions. This is going to be incredible. Then he comes back and it's like, somebody already gave me a meal and I already blessed them and they're going to be blessed. What? It's like it's gone, right? Your hopes and dreams for the future, gone. And so it's easy to hold a, a grudge when you're expecting something to happen, and it goes the opposite direction. There was a husband and wife who had their wills done exactly the same. Both wills stated that when they passed away, the farm and all the equipment would go to the only son in the family. The husband passed away around 25 years before the wife, and during that 25-year period, the wife changed her will to say that the farm and all the equipment would be sold at an auction and the proceeds divided equally among all the children. If there were any items the children wanted, they would have to purchase them at the auction. The only son was not happy with the change his mother had made in the will and and didn't know anything about it until her will was read by the lawyer. 
So he asked the lawyer if they could return to his father's will. Well, that had been executed 25 years ago. It was already done. It was complete. The lawyer told him that if he contested his mother's will, then the farm and all the equipment would be given to the state, and they would get nothing. So long story short, the change in his mother's will created feelings of anger and frustration and probably a grudge because he believed that he would receive everything. See how easy that happens? Like, oh, I'm expecting a certain thing to go my way. And when it doesn't go your way, then it's easy to hold that grudge. And we see Esau's plan. He thought to himself, isn't that interesting? I don't want us to gloss over that too quickly. The scripture says, he thought to himself. He didn't speak this out loud yet. I will wait until the, after the days of mourning are completed for my father's death, and then I will take a revenge on my brother Jacob. He was going to kill him. But it must, it must have slipped out of his brain through his mouth, and telling somebody else his plans because his mother finds out about it. Perhaps he thought that by killing Jacob, he would then assume the position of head of the family and by default receive everything that was given to Jacob in the blessing. Here's our second principle today. There are consequences for deception and sin. The consequences for Jacob was a death threat. <laughs> he had deceived and now his brother wants to kill him. The consequence for Esau was living with a grudge and hatred toward his brother until his father died. Now we're going to find out in just a little bit that they may have thought that Isaac was about to die. That's why Isaac's doing this. But when Jacob comes back after 20 years of being gone, <laughs> Isaac's still alive. That's a long time to hold a grudge. It's going to take a toll on your body. The stress of both of these things would have taken, like I said, a toll on their bodies physically. The third principle today is this deception divides families and relationships, even friends. Death would permanently divide Jacob and Esau without hope of reconciliation. Esau must have told someone in the family about his plan because they told Rebekah. And we see Rebekah's plan. When she heard that Esau was planning to kill Jacob, she sent for Jacob. She told Jacob about Esau's plan and then urged him to flee to Haran and stay with her brother Laban while Esau was, uh, until Esau was no longer angry. And she would send for Jacob when Esau had settled down. And we know that uh, that little while, as I already mentioned, turned into 20 years. And in fact, Rebecca never sent for Jacob, and she never saw Jacob again because she probably died in that 20-year period. Because as we get past this and, and Jacob comes back, nothing is said in Scripture about Rebecca at all. We don't see her again. And so that takes us back to principle two. There are consequences for our, descent, for our deception and sin. And the consequence for Rebecca's deception was that she never saw Jacob again, her favored son. And principle three, deception divides families. Rebecca probably had a strained relationship with her husband, Isaac, when he found out the part she played in the deception. And Rebecca was separated from her favored son, Jacob, for the rest of her life. And then we see Rebecca's concerns here, or her concern. She did not want to lose both sons in one day. Wolke says this, she probably has in mind that after Esau killed Jacob, he would be killed by an avenger of blood or by judicial decree demanding his execution for taking innocent life. Ironically, she suffers even more than she anticipates, at least socially, if not physically. Her relationship, if any, with Esau must have been irrevocably damaged, and she never sends for Jacob from his exile in Padan Aram. Finally, she even loses a memorial in Scripture, as we see in Genesis 35, 8. Though Rebecca parries Esau's violent resolve, nevertheless, she must taste the bitter consequences of her deception. So how does this apply to us? There are consequences for our deception and sin. Perhaps you're experiencing the consequences of deception or sin in your life right now. Maybe a family member refuses to talk with you because you deceived them. Maybe a friend won't return your calls or your text messages, and it takes time to restore trust once it's broken, but don't give up. Don't give up. Keep doing what's right and being open and honest with those family members and friends. That's the only way that you're going to restore trust is being completely transparent. That takes us to the second next step today, and that's to accept and embrace the consequences of my deception that's hard, right? That's not easy to do, to accept and embrace the consequences of the things that we've done wrong. But yeah, there are consequences. 
And then as it pertains to deception divides families, restoration is possible, but it takes humility on our part. We have to acknowledge our deception and sin. Then we have to go to those individuals we have deceived and confess our sin and seek their forgiveness. And that leads us to the third next step today, which is to strive to be honest in every relationship and seek forgiveness from those I've deceived. God can restore what's lost and broken when we humble ourselves before him. In way of review today, are you trying to accomplish your own plans instead of God's plan? What changes do you need to make? What consequences of deception do you need to accept and embrace today? Whom do you need to add or seek forgiveness from? And as a body of believers, what plan or plans does God want us to join him in for Idaville Church? What consequences of deception do we need to accept and embrace? And whom do we need to seek forgiveness from? In closing today, I just want to give you some words of wisdom from Gangle and Bramer's commentary. They kind of sum up not just today, but even what Pastor Mark shared last week. It's almost the whole chapter of 27. But I think these are important things for us to remember as we close. Our past failures do not negate God's future blessing. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad that he doesn't say, this is his mercy in action. (laughs) He doesn't give us what we do deserve. This is his grace in action. He gives us what we don't deserve. He still blesses us in spite of our failures. They don't negate God's future blessing. Sinfulness does not mean hopelessness. Satan wants you to believe that, though. He wants you to believe that because of the sin that you've done, there's no hope for the future, right? I'm never going to be able to come back from this. This is it. It's it's over. No, don't believe that lie. Sinfulness does not mean hopelessness. God's in control, right? He's still going to accomplish his plan and purpose. Our failures do not destroy God's promises. (laughs) Thank you, Lord, right? Our failures don't destroy his promises. We must trust God for what we do not see, even when we, even what we, well, I can't say it, even when we see a mess. So what we might be looking at is not what God's trying to accomplish. We need to, we need to, to trust God for what we can't see that he's doing. And then finally, faith looks forward, not backward. Aren't you glad for that? That's the faith that we have to trust God. We're going to look forward. No matter what the mess that happened in the past, we're not worrying about that anymore. We're looking forward because God's in control and he loves us and he's concerned about us and he's going to take care of us. He's going to provide for us. Do you believe that today? I think these words of wisdom are so powerful for us today and can bring such incredible healing to our hearts and minds. I hope that the Holy Spirit's working, that you're allowing him to work in your hearts and minds. And so as the worship team come, would you just bow your heads with me uh, as we just commit this to the Lord in prayer and then as we worship him. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you that even though there's consequences for our sin, that Lord, our failures don't negate uh, your promises and your plan and your purpose. We thank you that we can trust you and that you can bring healing. We thank you that you are over everything, Lord God, as we're going to sing here in just a moment. You're in control, and we just trust you completely. And because of that, we just have joy, and we have peace. We have confidence in you. And Lord God, wow, deception brings consequences and, and divides family and friends. <laughs> Lord, 